This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening tips to improve our environment. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Carol Gracie. Carol is an environmentalist, a naturalist, a writer, and a wonderful photographer, and the author of several books. And uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. But I'd just like to introduce Carol and say welcome. Thanks for joining Thank you, me. Kim. It's fun to talk with you. Well, Carol, um, I know you uh, first of all through this book, Wildflowers in the Field and Forest, which uh, is a terrific guide a field guide to the northeastern United States and I also know you from this wonderful book this is your latest yes. spring wildflowers of the Northeast and uh, how did you come to know so much about our wildflowers I've just always been interested even when I was a child I was interested in learning about the wildflowers and bringing bouquets home etc not anything endangered but mm -hmm. just things like daisies etc and um, it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I really began learning the names of what they were, the scientific names. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I found that, you know, very interesting and meaningful. But then I wanted to learn more about them. Hence the, the second book, The Spring Wildflowers, okay. in which I delve into the natural history. Right. And much of that information was gathered just by observing, mm -hmm. just by sitting there and watching what visits the flowers, and also reading a lot of scientific papers, things that Good unfortunately are not available mm -hmm. to the public. Mm -hmm. They're usually hidden away in a journal, and they're kind of deadly, I, I must Difficult say so to read. myself. Right, a lot of right. technical terms, but a lot of wonderful mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you had a career for about 30 years at the New York Botanical Garden. I did. Both yeah. as an educator, as I understand, and you also were um, leader of foreign tours. Talk a little right. bit about places that you went. And Oh, I've, I've been lucky enough to be to, been to um, Galapagos five times. Five times. To the Amazon over 20 times. Oh my gosh. And then with my husband, who's a tropical botanist at the Botanical Garden, we've um, worked in both Brazil and French Guiana for oh, maybe 20 years or so. Fantastic. On uh, collecting trips and research projects. Wow. So I kind of got drawn away from my first love, the native wildflowers, during okay. that period. But and, now I'm back. And when you were teaching at uh, New York Botanical Garden, what uh, types of things were you teaching? Well, I ran the children's education program mm -hmm. for a number of years, wrote the curricula, trained the other teachers, mm -hmm. trained the tour guides. And then I um, took on at the same time the foreign travel program. Mm -hmm. But then after I married my husband, who I met at the Botanical Garden, he convinced me to leave my job and work with him, which sounded exciting. So that's when I kept the travel portion, took it with me into the science department, mm -hmm. and um, worked with Scott on various research mm -hmm. projects. And so you now have time to write these fantastic books. I do. I'm now officially retired. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like well, it from <laughs> I just don't get output. paid, let's put oh, it that okay. way. <laughs> and um, you have a new book coming out in uh, approximately 2016, I understand? Probably 2016, 17. Okay. And that will be very similar to the Spring Wildflower book except it will be about summer wildflowers. Okay. And I really wanted to do that because I think everybody is excited about spring wildflowers mm -hmm. after a long cold winter like we've just had. Mm -hmm. But then they get busy with other things in the summer. They're going on vacation, going to the beach, etc. And they don't pay as much attention to the, the flowers that grow in the fields or go into the forest as much. And yes. those flowers are equally interesting. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've already begun working on that. Well, you were very generous to take me on a hike in a beautiful spot in Connecticut right. to take a look at some of our spring wildflowers. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really great. And we're going to show some of that footage in this video. But um, talk a little bit about why wildflowers are so important to us. Well, I think that our forest, which once covered the entire eastern part of the country, are places where these flowers and their pollinators and seed dispersers co-evolved. Mm -hmm. So they're dependent on each other. They're timed, for instance, um, one of the plants we saw in great profusion the other day at the site in Connecticut was Dutchman's breeches and squirrel corn, a close relative. And those plants evolved to flower exactly at the time that the queen bumblebees are emerging from underground. The queens are the only ones that overwinter and it's up to them to start new hives. And in order to do so, they need um, 
nectar mm -hmm. for their own energy requirements, and they need pollen that they put into a, a ball-like structure and put into their hives to lay their eggs on so mm -hmm. the larvae have something to feed, feed upon. So these early flowers are obviously really critical to those queen bumblebees. They're very bumblebees. critical. Mm -hmm. But bumblebees are important all through the season, not just spring, mm -hmm. but through the summer. They're very important pollinators. They're native bees. And not only bumblebees, but we have many small, what are called solitary bees, mm -hmm. also usually living in rotting wood or underground. And they're extremely important for the spring ephemerals. Mm -hmm. That's their, their and you, prime time. You mentioned spring ephemerals, so for um, folks that are watching this video who are not familiar with what a spring ephemeral is, could you just define that for us? Well, a lot of the plants, especially the ones I just mentioned, like Dutchman's breeches and squirrel corn, are present above ground, at least, for a very short period of time. They bloom, they, well, first of all, they produce their leaves, they bloom, they form their seed pods, drop their seeds, the leaves turn yellow and wither and they mm -hmm. disappear. Mm -hmm. But they haven't died. The mm -hmm. reason for them blooming at that time of year is that the forest canopy has not yet filled in. So there's enough sunlight hitting the floor in the forest for those plants to photosynthesize and store all that carbohydrate underground to get an early start the next year. Mm -hmm. And therefore those early flying bees, both the bumblebees and the the smaller solitary bees will have a source of, of food and nectar mm -hmm. the next year. And from a gardening perspective, spring ephemerals are kind of great because they give you an opportunity to plant some other things that bloom later they close do. by. Yeah, because those will disappear and you need something to fill in those places. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're great for that reason. And, and name, they're also beautiful. And the more mm -hmm. people plant them in their gardens, the more food there will be for the pollinators. Right. Name some of your favorite spring ephemerals here in the Northeast. Hmm. I know it's kind of like naming your favorite child. Exactly, <laughs> right. Um, well, it tends to be the one I'm looking at at the moment. I mean, I do love the violets, and mm -hmm. they're just sort of simple little plants. Many people consider them weeds because one of them, the common blue violet, does get into people's lawns and mm -hmm. cause a problem. But I find them very interesting because they have a, an interesting flower structure with a long spur, longer in some than in others, that requires an insect with a long tongue to get back mm -hmm. in and get the nectar. And in doing so, they press against the reproductive parts, the pollen-bearing anthers, for instance, and bring pollen to the next violet, mm -hmm. and that will be able to form seeds then. And one that we saw the other day up in the side in Connecticut was um, the West Virginia white butterfly, mm -hmm. which looks much like our cabbage butterfly. It's a relative. Mm -hmm. It feeds on members of the cabbage family, which in this case are usually um, a small, again, effervescent or ephemeral um, spring wildflowers mm -hmm. like um, toothwort. Okay. And then they they pollinate our violets. Mm -hmm. So they're doing harm to one plant, although I've also seen them visiting the flowers of toothwort, but they're bringing um, pollination services mm -hmm. to the other plant. Mm -hmm. And the violets, um, I know a lot of people are reluctant to use them in their gardens, but we have such a beautiful array of native violets, and uh, they're host plants to fritillary butterflies too. Yes, exactly. So very important. <laughs> so they're playing an important role in terms of being a host plant. Mm -hmm. Any other There's always a trade-off, you know, they feed yes. some plants, some insects, and other insects yes. rely on them for and, and oftentimes the feeding that occurs is not uh, terribly detrimental. It might be slight feeding um, sometimes. Right, if you may lose a leaf or so, yes. you're not going to lose the whole plant. Right, so tolerating some damage in our gardens to be ecologically right. friendly is, is right. really important. Exactly. Any other violets that you particularly like um, for garden settings? Well, I think there's one that would make a great ground cover. It's called the round-leaved yellow violet. Mm -hmm. Blooms very, very early. It has, obviously, round leaves, which mm -hmm. is how it gets its name, viola rotundiflora, rotundifolia. And it, um, its leaves keep growing throughout the summer season mm -hmm. and form big, round clusters of leaves, mm -hmm. which, if you plant a lot of them, can make a great ground cover in shade, yep. much like things like um, a sarum or um, wild ginger. Wild ginger. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So many of those are great for shady ground covers. Absolutely. And when you see them uh, in the wild as we did, I mean, it's really quite breathtaking. Mm -hmm. um, one plant that we saw that was not a spring ephemeral that I've tried to grow in my own garden was Taxus canadensis, Canadian yew, right. which looked horrible in my garden, but looked absolutely fantastic at the site in Connecticut because right. it was really in the right place. It's a little bit colder, mm -hmm. a little bit damper. I haven't seen your garden, but you may not have that no, really. No, it doesn't look that good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So plants mm -hmm. need a certain habitat. Mm -hmm. You've got to plant according to what you have. Yes. And one of the other plants that we saw quite a bit of um, was Trillium erectum. Oh, we must have seen 2,000. Yeah, maybe. at least. Yeah. At least. And so what are the particular conditions that plant likes? So what, what can we provide in our garden that might make that plant happy? Well, they like shade. They mm -hmm. live um, in the understory of, of forest. Mm -hmm. So plant them in the shade. They can take a little bit of sun. Mm -hmm. Um, those that we saw there were so large. I've only They're seen huge. them that large in yes. a few other places. I don't know exactly what the conditions are mm -hmm. that are so perfect there, but they are certainly happy. There are masses and masses of right. them. Right. And, and um, let me just say that yes. the reason I took you to that site with masses and masses of so many wildflowers is that evidently they don't have the deer pressure that we have here in Westchester. Yes. You know, we've fragmented our forest mm -hmm. to the degree that deer really are, are desperate for food. Mm -hmm. They eat almost anything, mm -hmm. including our wildflowers. So I, I find it very difficult to go to many places that I've known since I, I moved up here in the early 70s where I could always find trillium and always find yes. orchids. Yes. And they're gone. Yes, a lot of deer pressure for yes. sure. Right. And so nature's really not in balance the way that it needs to be in our home no. landscapes. No, part of that is what we've done to the landscapes. Mm -hmm. Part of that is um, the loss of predators. Mm -hmm. We have coyotes in quite a good number, at least where I live. And they may take down a small deer. It's unusual that they would take down a large deer. Yes, yes. And uh, forgot to mention that we're actually filming here at your home with this beautiful landscape. Um, the amazing uh, water feature behind us and lovely wildflowers all around us. Um, and I assume you have some deer, perhaps. <laughs> well, that I also have a deer fence. Yes, I tried yes. the first year or two planting things mm -hmm. that were so-called deer resistant, mm -hmm. things with milky sap, things with um, fuzzy leaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They ate them all. Oh dear, and so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no deer. So I finally mm -hmm. put up my uh, Stalag 17 fence and mm. So far, it's been effective. So unfortunately, the reality in, in a lot of northeastern landscapes, if we want to have some of these wildflowers, which we should, and we right. have deer pressure, we do have to guard against deer, right. either mechanically or you through appropriate spray. sprays. Yes, yeah. exactly. But you have to be diligent yes. to make sure you get out there repeatedly throughout yes. the season. I do it for certain things that are outside of the fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now another, um, and I, I just want to continue on the trillium for a minute because um, folks might be surprised that they're a bit expensive when you buy them at some garden centers, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a reason for that. You want to talk a little bit about why? Well, the reason is that to get a, a plant to flowering size may take anywhere from six or seven years up to 15 years, mm -hmm. depending on the species. Mm -hmm. And thus, if you're growing them from a conservation standpoint where you start with seed, mm -hmm you're going to have to put a lot of yes. effort, a lot of time, a lot of space into growing those trillium mm -hmm. until they're what are called marketable size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that makes it very tempting for people to cheat. Yes. And, you know, take a shortcut somehow and, and not do that. Mm -hmm. Even those that you sometimes see in a nursery that are called nursery grown. Mm -hmm may not have originated in the nursery. Mm -hmm. Somebody might have wild dug them. It right. happens especially further south. And then they ship them up here as you know, wild trillium. Mm -hmm. And so but, a good practice is probably when you're buying a trillium to ask the nursery, where did this trillium come from? You should ask, where and these you well should dug? ask friends and others in the know if that nursery is trustworthy. Yes, yes. Because it really is important. That's another reason that we're losing some of our important mm -hmm. plants. In fact, ginseng, which is dug for mm -hmm, other purposes, mm -hmm. for the so-called medicinal mm -hmm. properties that it has. 
Um, we've lost that throughout much of its range. Yes, yes. I know even in the Smokies, there's an enormous loss mm -hmm. of that particular mm -hmm. plant because it's wild dug. Right. Um, another plant that we saw that was phenomenal, the largest I've ever seen anywhere, were trout lilies. Yes. Um, must have been really, really happy. It must have been a very good year for trout lilies. But yeah, talk a little bit about that plant because that, that biology one, is interesting. Another one of the spring ephemerals. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it sends up its leaves, then its flowers. The leaves last a little bit longer than those of, say, Dutchman's breeches. Mm -hmm. But um, then they'll completely disappear. Mm -hmm. And it's a plant that um, is pollinated by, by one of those smaller native bees, mm -hmm. often andrenid bees, mm -hmm. they're called. And andrenid bees are interesting because people may see in their their gardens, especially at the edge of the woods and the grass, they may see holes and think, oh, I've got a problem with mm -hmm, ants. Mm -hmm. But these, if they're a little bit larger mounds with larger holes, they're probably some of these native bees. Mm -hmm. And you can determine that just by sitting there and watching. Yes. Because you'll see a bee coming in with pollen mm -hmm. on its hind legs and then leaving without it. Mm -hmm. It takes many, many of those loads to make a pollen ball yes. that's large enough to feed a larva. So you're making a really excellent point about not only planting things that support our ecosystems, but also understanding habitat. As I, I try to suggest to folks to leave some bare soil or lightly vegetated areas, right. because right. most of our native bees are ground dwellers right. and mm -hmm. uh, would be using that kind mm -hmm. of habitat. Yeah, and absolutely. I find a lot of people are terrified of any bees, you mm -hmm. know, especially the big bumblebees, which, as I already mentioned, are one of our most important mm -hmm. pollinators. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're they're really not going to bother anybody no. unless they are bothered, mm -hmm. and um, then it's their right to get even. Yes, <laughs> I, I the only time I've ever had trouble with a bee was when I got too close to a nest unintentionally, and yeah. um, you know got stung once, but that right. um, in many years of being around bees, never right. had any other problem. Yeah, I also had that happen where one got caught in the sleeve of my shirt. Oh dear. And panicked. And <laughs> <laughs> it hurt, but you know, it was one sting and it got better. Mm -hmm. And how about some other um, spring ephemerals that, that you think are noteworthy you'd like to talk about? Maybe ones that we saw. Oh, let me see. What did we see that day? We saw, we so, saw many. so much. We right. saw, in we fact, saw we have a, a list. We saw a flower. Yes, we had about 40 um, different species that right. we saw, I think. Right. Um, foam flower we saw, and that's a lovely garden plant. It is. In fact, I knew it first as a garden plant. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen it in the wild up north here in mm -hmm. a few places. I see it when I go further south. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it works very well in the garden. It blooms early. Mm -hmm but it keeps its leaves and they're attractive leaves. Sometimes even where we were, we saw variegated leaves, Yes. which is what nursery people often like. They mm -hmm. like any sort of little bit different leaf. Yes. Um, now, now Tiarella, the foam flower, there's right. a running variety and a clumping variety. And we saw clumping, I think, if we I'm did. correct. Yeah, okay. We did, yeah, right. And they seem to be very easy care, low maintenance plants. Mm -hmm. uh, what pollinates Tiarella? You know, I'm not sure about that one. Probably small I, bees. I, yeah, I think I don't I've see spotted it often that. enough to to watch and mm -hmm. see what comes to it. Mm -hmm. But talking about those that are really easy, both to plant and to have spread in your garden, another one is bloodroot. Oh yes, that's lovely. And isn't bloodroot it? has very ephemeral flowers mm -hmm. in that they they bloom early in the spring in April. And once they have attracted their pollinators, they drop their petals. Okay. So that may be just as, as little as a three-day period. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're not very showy. So The flowers. The flowers, but the, but the leaves <laughs> are absolutely beautiful. Yes. They're a very irregularly yes. lobed leaf, very pretty leaf. And they, again, make a great ground cover mm -hmm. because although the flowers are ephemeral, the leaves mm -hmm. are not. They last right into the end of summer. And I've seen them. Well, actually, in Connecticut, we saw them. They were quite enormous, yes. um, much they larger than you. They can get to be maybe seven, eight inches across. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will spread easily by seed dispersal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're one of many spring ephemerals that have what's called an eliasome a little fatty appendage mm -hmm. on the seed that is relished by ants. And ants don't eat the seeds right where they fall. They tend to take them back to their nests or someplace away mm -hmm. from the plant. 
which means that that plant has a chance to grow someplace else, get its seeds dispersed to what may be a better habitat, mm -hmm. or at least to a different place so that if anything happens to the original site, mm -hmm. it will be still growing someplace else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's true of trout lily, of Dutchman's breeches, of squirrel corn, of trillium. Mm -hmm. Many of these plants have seed dispersal by ants. Which, so ants are also a good yeah, thing. Yeah, sure, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. And, yeah. A, and another thing I think worthy of mentioning is um, not all pollinators are bees. So oh, no. a lot of um, our our flowers are fly pollinated or right. beetle pollinated. Right. We saw blue cohosh the other day, yes, for example. That's right. Another one that's great in shady areas because its leaves remain throughout the, the season and they get to be maybe a foot and a half tall mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. The flowers are not very showy. Most people don't plant them for the flowers, but they plant them for the leaves or what are so-called fruits, mm -hmm. which I have to put in quotation marks, mm -hmm. because those beautiful blue berries from which they get their name are actually the seeds of the plant. Mm -hmm. And we don't really see the fruit because those seeds develop so rapidly that early on they split right through the, the fruit wall mm -hmm. and it just withers up and disappears. Okay. And then the seed keeps growing until it's about the size of maybe a little smaller in diameter than a dime mm -hmm. and changes color right at the time that um, the fall migration is beginning, the end of August and through September. Mm -hmm. And they don't all change at once. There's a sequence of changing, even on the same plant, mm -hmm. where they go from sort of a greenish white, sometimes even to a pinkish color, to turquoise blue, to a deep blueberry blue, mm -hmm. which is what is so attractive to birds. Right. And they feel they're going to get a, a wonderful, rich, berry-like meal. Mm -hmm when in fact they're fooled. It's, oh dear. <laughs> it's um, seed dispersal by deception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they fly off carrying these seeds with them and excrete them someplace further south where those plants will have a chance That's to really grow again. That's really interesting. And um, trillium obviously has berries. I've never seen a bird go to a trillium berry, but I kind of wonder if they do eat them. Well, they usually split open just on their own. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the seeds have a lyosome, so they mm -hmm. fall on to trillium the ground. Too. Okay. And those are taken not only by ants, but I've been told, I've never seen this, sometimes by wasps as well. Oh, interesting. And I've even heard stories of wasps <clears throat> stealing the seeds from ants as the ants wow. have been on their way back to their nesting site. Well, competition. It is, yeah. Please join me for part two of my interview with Carol Gracie coming soon. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful gardening tips to improve our environment, please visit us at www.ecobeneficial.com. <laughs>